Deck Masters, a weird one-off mechanic that really didn't see any attention outside of the virtual world arc from the original anime. According to the arc, every monster in the database of Virtual World has a unique Deck Master ability. The only resurgence that this mechanic has seen was in Konami's recent official alternative to the standard format of the physical game, which is riddled with problems when implementing the entire modern card pool. It's literally the only format in which the god cards are good. Aside from the fact that it's nowhere near as popular in comparison to GOAT and Edison formats, or as Konami calls it, TIME WIZARD FORMAT Nonetheless, the Virtual World arc introduced the idea of Deck Masters, and as much as I dislike the arc itself, I think there could have been a lot more done with the mechanic if the arc was given a bit more breathing room. So, I decided to subject myself to re-watching the entire Virtual World arc, my least favorite arc of the series. And today, let's take a look at all of the Deck Masters that were used during the Virtual World arc, and how those monsters differed from their original card counterparts, and maybe we'll even rank them if you're lucky. The first three and probably lesser known Deck Masters shown in Virtual World came from the very first episode of the arc where the deck master mechanic is explained to our team of protagonists through an exhibition duel between Virtual Kaiba and the Total Defense Shogun. Blue Eyes White Dragon was Virtual Kaiba's original deck master, however it wasn't shown to have any special ability as a deck master, which matches its vanilla monster counterpart. Upon fusing his deck master Blue Eyes with two that he summoned, his new deck master became the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, which is normally a vanilla fusion monster. As a deck master, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon has the ability to attack immediately, which differs from the rule of summoning sickness that standard fusion monsters carry during the Battle City and Virtual World arc. But this instant attack ability would be wasted when faced against Total Defense Shogun. In the regular game, this monster has the effect to change itself to defense position upon normal summon, and it can attack while in defense position, applying its attack value for damage calculation. As a deck master, Total Defense Shogun has an ability called Total Defense Barrier, which redirects an opponent's attack back at them. And in the context of a deck master duel, it's an automatic loss for your opponent if they've attacked with their deck master. Getting into the ranking, both Blue Eyes deck masters are pretty lackluster. And of course, that's going on the notion that the original Blue Eyes White Dragon doesn't have a unique deck master ability. I'd rank them both at F tier. Total Defense Shogun, on the other hand, is a total blowout, easily making it into A tier. Not quite an S tier because it can be worked around with relative ease, but it does force your opponent to be more reserved during their battle phase. The first actual duel in the arc pitted Yugi and his fate chosen deck master Karibo against Gansley as the Deep Sea Warrior. Deep Sea Warrior's original monster effect grants it protection from all spell cards while Umi is face up on the field, which in turn actually prevents the Umi retrains from boosting this monster and that's hilarious. Under the deck master system, Deep Sea Warrior has an ability called Reflector Hole, which allows the controller to tribute two monsters they control to reflect any attack on their monsters back at their opponent, but excludes direct attacks. So, an overall worse version of Total Defense Shogun's Deck Master ability, but still an improvement over its original monster effect. Karibo, on the other hand, didn't offer much outside of its standard effect, although it did aid in Yugi winning his duel against Gansley. The original Karibo can discard itself on a quick effect to reduce the battle damage from one attack to zero. As a deck master, Karibo creates an impenetrable wall to block a direct attack by playing itself to the field. It's somewhat of a combination between its original effect and the spell card Multiply, which fills your field with Karibo tokens. Needless to say, it's a risky move because it seems like the ability activates immediately when the circumstances are met. So the deck master could put itself in play very early in the game, and then you're left playing Protect the Castle with a Karibo of all things. Neither of these deck master abilities are necessarily bad, but they are also not great, so I would rank them both at a D tier. Going into the next duel in Virtual Hell, we have a monster that should be putting a lot of people on some kind of watch list, Taya's Dark Magician Girl, as well as Crump's 
Nightmare Penguin. The first Deckmaster ability that we see comes from Nightmare Penguin, which in the regular game has the continuous effect to increase the attack of all monsters you control by 200. And if this monster is flipped face up, you can bounce one card your opponent controls back to their hand. As Crump's Deckmaster, it retains the boosting ability, and that's it, so it's pretty lame. Taya's Dark Magician Girl, on the other hand, is actually pretty cracked. With her Dark Magic Energy ability as a Deckmaster, if the controller has four monsters in their graveyard, it allows the controller to excavate the top four cards of their deck and add one of those cards to their hand. And thankfully, they completely ignored her original monster effect, which increases her attack by 300 for every Dark Magician and Magician of Black Chaos in the graveyard. Graveyard. The difference between the abilities of these two deck masters is night and day. Nightmare Penguin gets an easy F tier, and although it kills me ever so slightly, Dark Magician Girl gets a very easy S tier. It may not be Thanksgiving, but I'd also like to express how thankful I am that none of these duels overlapped with one another, which made it very easy in my research. Next up is Johnson's Judge Man and Joey's Flame Swordsman. Joey spared no time in using his Deckmaster's ability which allowed him to decrease the attack of Flame Swordsman to increase the attack of one of his warrior monsters by the same amount. It might not be the most groundbreaking ability, but it outclasses the original effect of Flame Swordsman, which is nothing, so we can't complain too much. Johnson's Judge Man follows suit in being an improvement over the original normal monster with a Deckmaster ability called Clear the Courtroom. At the cost of 1000 life points on a quick effect, Judge Man forces the opponent to destroy all monsters they control, then inflicts 500 damage to them for each monster destroyed. Far better in every way compared to Flame Swordsman's Deckmaster ability, so I'd rank it at an A tier. As for Flame Swordsman, it's not bad, but you're not given a whole lot of real estate to work with in the Swordsman's 1800 base attack, so I'd rank it at C tier. Following Joey and Johnson's courtroom showdown, we move into the handicap match, 3 on 1, with Tristan's Super Robayaru, Serenity's Goddess with a Third Eye, Duke Devlin's Strike Ninja, and Nesbit's Robotic Knight. Nesbit kicked off the first use of a Deckmaster ability in this duel with his Robotic Knight's ability called Final Artillery. Using this ability, Nesbit can discard any number of machine type monsters from his hand to inflict 500 damage to the opponent for each one. Robotic Knight, as we know it, is a subpar vanilla beat stick, so there's a clear winner here. When the rules of the Deckmaster duels were explained to our protagonist, one of the biggest takeaways should have been that if your Deckmaster is destroyed in battle after moving to the field, then you automatically lose the duel. So, one of the last moves that you should commit to is using Super Robayaru's ability to intercept an attack on one of your monsters, unless you can ensure that Mega Man's stepdad over here won't be destroyed. At a measly 1200 attack, or at least that would be the case if not for its second ability to increase its attack by 1000 when activating its ability, which is a bit better at 2200. But wait, that's not all. Super Robayaru's third Deckmaster ability allows you to set the Rare Metal Soul spell card from your deck. Even with three abilities as a Deckmaster, it's still less of a threat than its in-game monster counterpart. Super Robayaru is originally a fusion monster made by fusing Robayaru and Lady Robayaru. In addition to the 1000 attack point boost carried over to the Deckmaster, instead of setting Rare Metal Soul from the deck, Super Robayaru can tag out into Super Lady Robayaru. They're really just the same monsters with different names, but I think that this would have made for a better deckmaster ability by dodging destruction with tagouts. You're probably expecting the next deckmaster to be goddess with a third eye, but we technically have to address Perfect Machine King, which became Nesbitt's deckmaster when Robotic Knight was combined with Machine King. I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about it though, as Perfect Machine King only retained the real world card's effect to increase its own attack by 500 for every machine type monster on the field. Robotic Knight is definitely the better option. On to a real deck master in Goddess with the Third Eye used by Serenity. Its regular monster effect allows it to be substituted for any one named fusion material for the fusion summon of a fusion monster, one of the many fusion substitute monsters from the earliest era of the game. As the deck master, Goddess has an ability called Fusion Vision, where she can substitute herself for the effect of polymerization by discarding one spell card, allowing the controller to perform a single fusion summon. 
Both of these effects are nearly equal in terms of their use and power, but I'd have to give her Deckmaster ability the edge. All things considered, it's much easier to search materials for a fusion monster than polymerization in most scenarios. So, having that immediate access can come in clutch. And last in this duel is Duke's Strike Ninja, which I'm pretty sure was only selected because it was seen in the Dungeon Dice Monsters episodes, as was the case with his entire deck. I can say for sure that Duke had my favorite showcase in the Virtual World duels, and this was where we first got to see some of the once Dungeon Dice Monster exclusives translated to the show's card game. This one is a bit strange though. Strike Ninja as a monster is a GOAT format Hall of Famer, with a quick effect to banish itself until the end phase by banishing two dark monsters from your graveyard. There are very few decks of the format that this card can't fit into and it's deserving of its praise. But as a deck master, I'm confused. In the context of the duel, Duke was able to activate Tristan's last face down card by discarding two cards, and because he was able to do this in the midst of Serenity's turn, I can assume it was a quick effect. That's all pretty straightforward, but I'm more confused on the implications outside of that specific instance. Does Strike Ninja allow you to activate any one face down card on the field, including your opponents? What happens if the card selected is being activated outside of its activation window, and why was Strike Ninja a level 5 monster with 2350 attack in the anime? I'm asking you these questions. Well, we have a lot to rank here. Five deck masters and all of them vary pretty heavily from one another. I guess we'll go best to worst. Goddess with the third eye gets an A tier for all of the reasons I stated before. Robotic Knight also gets an A tier. I'm putting Strike Ninja in C tier, that's only because there's a lot of unknowns on what his full deck master ability entails, and I don't even feel good about that. Super Robayaru gets a D tier because its ability is almost completely useless in the context of the deck master system, and lastly, Perfect Machine King gets an F tier. Not because it's bad, but because it doesn't do anything outside of being its regular ass self. Kaiba vs. Lecter is, in my opinion, the only saving grace for this arc. If not for this duel, this arc would be complete trash. Personal gripes aside, Kaiba utilized the Lord of Dragons as his deck master, and Lecter took on the form of Jinzo. Jinzo is another monster that needs no introduction, an absolute menace of a monster during its heyday, and even seeing niche play from time to time in the modern game. With its original effect to negate the effects of all trap cards, not only could it counter all of your opponent's strongest traps, but it seems impossible to improve on that. Or is it? Jinzo's Deck Master ability, with no fancy name unfortunately, takes Jinzo's regular effect and applies it to only your opponent. So you as the controller are free to use all of your trap cards. Yeah, that's pretty good. Kaiba's Lord of Dragons, one of his staple monsters, originally had the continuous effect to protect all Dragon-type monsters on the field from being targeted for card effects. Its Deck Master ability allows the controller to normal summon an additional Dragon-type monster each turn at the cost of 500 life points, a no-brainer for Kaiba's Dragon-heavy deck. This ranking is a bit interesting. In the context of their duel with Lecter's specific strategy, Jinzo's Deck Master ability is clearly overpowered. Powered. But outside of that, it isn't really much better than Jinzo's standard monster effect. That being said, Jinzo could never go below an A tier. It's a classic for a reason. The abilities of Lord of Dragon as a deck master and as a regular monster both serve completely different purposes, but both of them are outstanding. Another A tier, it may not be as powerful as Jinzo, but it's in the same league as far as power is concerned. Going into the second to last duel, the Big Five come back with a vengeance, facing off against Joey and Yugi, where we see six new deck masters. Yugi begins the duel with Dark Magician. When fused with Joey's Flame Swordsman deck master, their shared deck master becomes the Dark Flare Knight. When destroyed, their new shared deck master becomes Mirage Knight, which then returns to their starting deck masters. The Big Five would combine all of their deck masters to create the five headed dragon, and upon destruction, their final deck master would become Berserk Dragon. Also, Yugi's deck master would become Dark Magician Knight towards the end of the duel. Let's get the easy ones out of the way Dark Flare Knight, Mirage Knight, Dark Magician Knight, Five-Headed Dragon, and Berserk Dragon simply retained their real-world card effects as their deck master abilities. Dark Flare Knight makes the controller take no battle damage in battles involving it and floats into Mirage Knight. Mirage Knight gains the attack of an opponent's monster at battles during damage calculation only, then banishes itself to summon Dark Magician and Flame Swordsman, which I guess is sort of a new addition to its effects. Five-Headed Dragon can only be destroyed in battle by a light monster. Berserk Dragon can attack each of your opponent's monsters 
once during each battle phase and loses 500 attack during each of your end phases. And Dark Magician Knight can only be special summoned with Knight's title, and when special summoned, it destroys one card in the field, although this effect wasn't used in the anime. OG Dark Magician, on the other hand, got a pretty significant buff over its vanilla counterpart. At the cost of 1,000 life points, it can copy the effect of a spell card activated during your turn. As much as I hate Dark Magician, I can't deny that this effect kicks ass. On to the ranking, because the first five deck masters didn't do anything outside of their regular effects, they all go into F tier. Not including Mirage Knight, who I'm putting at a D tier for at least floating into Dark Magician and Flame Swordsman. Dark Magician gets an S tier, which kills my soul just as much as putting Dark Magician Girl there, but getting a double spell effect is extremely powerful, so I'd be lying to say it belongs anywhere else. This video might be the death of me, but it certainly won't convince me to pick up a Dark Magician deck. The final duel, finally bringing the Virtual World arc to a close, thank god, features Noah vs Kaiba and Yugi individually. This time around, Kaiba opts for the Kaiser Seahorse as his deck master, and Noah begins the duel with Shinado's Ark. The power creep on Shinado's Ark is a deck master versus its real game card, which is a ritual spell card, mind you, needs to be studied. The deck master ability of Shinado's Ark begins with consuming every monster that is sent to the graveyard. During your opponent's turn, you can special summon a monster from inside the Ark in defense position for each face-up monster your opponent controls. During your turn, Turn, you can banish every monster inside the arc to gain 500 life points for each. For some reason, only this ability has a special name, that being Regeneration of Light. And if you thought we were done, I have some unfortunate news. Let this man cook. Because if Shinado's arc is destroyed in battle, it floats into Shinado, the king of a higher plane, which takes the place of the deck master. Yeah, we're really just ignoring the whole deck master rule thing with all of these floating monsters, I guess. Kaiba's Kaiser Seahorse lacks in comparison, which is a shame because its deck master ability is a straight upgrade over the monster card. Kaiser Seahorse's original effect allows it to count as two tributes for the tribute summon of a light monster. Now, if only I could think of one that would fit that criteria. As for its deck master ability, the Seahorse now allows its user to normal summon a light attribute monster once per turn for one less tribute. Okay, so maybe it's not a stellar upgrade over the original, but still far more useful in the confides of deck master rules. Ranking these is really no debate. The Ark gets an S tier, because where else are you going to put it other than S plus or something? Kaiser Seahorse I'd give a B tier, just because I like the alteration of ability while still remaining true to the OG effect. With the Ark's transformation into the King, we've reached our culmination of this strange and overly long side quest that our heroes were subjected to. Which, speaking of, what do you think Merrick was up to during this whole ordeal? The only deck master that we have left is Noah's Shinado King of a Higher Plane, who was originally a classic ritual monster with the effect to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the original attack of a defense position monster that it destroys in battle. Piercing damage, but not really. Noah really ups the ante with Shinado's deck master ability, Divine Ring. When Shinado destroys an opponent's defense position monster, it halves the opponent's life points, and in about 90 or so percent of all scenarios, that will be better than inflicting damage based on the destroyed monster's attack value. Adding insult, salt, and just plain disrespect to these injuries, the controller also gains life points equal to the amount lost by the opponent. Because he clearly wasn't anywhere near oppressive enough to the main team as a villain should be, Shinado is also the only deck master shown that can retreat from the field and return to its position as a deck master, an ability called Reversal. Safe to say we're going out with a bang on this last deck master. And that being said, I would only put Shinado at an A tier. Although this ability is great, continuously having your opponent's life points doesn't win you the game. It's a big show that still relies on monsters to finish the job. Before we wrap up today's video, I just forced myself to rewatch this entire arc, so I'm more than qualified to rant about it. This arc big sucks. Not because the duels were lackluster, although they were, not because of Noah's literal god complex, although the daddy issues are loud with this one. The fucking puns throughout nearly every duel made me physically ill. I understand that each member of the Big Five held a strong business position in the original Kaiba Corps, and their deck masters were a reflection of them, but did their entire character and mannerisms have to be based around that? Business lingo this. 
Crunching the numbers that, I'm a lawyer and can only speak legalese. How about all of the icy one-liners from Crump and Taya's duel? Clearly, I was corrupted at some point in this endeavor because I created a flowchart that represents the amount of times that I wanted to throw myself out of a second story window during each episode. The number continues to rise as the arc progresses, but somehow I made it out alive. Easily the worst arc in all of Duel Monsters.